Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you this evening to the first of OCD Action's new webinar series. My name's Lee Wolvank, and I'm the CEO at OCD Action. And I'm incredibly pleased to be able to welcome you to tonight's webinar, um, Beyond the Myths, Exploring the Reality of OCD, which promises, I think, to be an incredibly informative and inspiring evening. I'm also incredibly grateful um, to Dr. Rob Wilson and Catherine Benfield for giving up their evenings to join us this evening on our panel. Um, and, and also to to them for sharing their thoughts and experiences with them. I think the evening promises to be um, a really exciting evening. And I'm also incredibly grateful to each of you for giving up your time. I can see that every second or so another person joins and I think we're all really looking forward to this evening. Just to give you a sense of the webinar series that we're going to be running over the next year, in this kind of first week of each month, we're going to be holding a webinar um, online like this um, each, each month for two hours. And our aim for these sessions is to hold um, a, a webinar on kind of the big topics that members of the community are sharing with us, are things that people want to hear something informative and inspiring about. So topics such as navigating the NHS, learning more about treatment, exploring and managing setbacks in treatment and building supportive relationships. And in each session, we'll be doing similar to we are tonight. So um, working with a clinician um, and um, also hearing from an inspirational speaker who has lived experience of OCD. So thinking specifically about tonight's session and how that will work, we will, the, the webinar itself will last about two hours. There'll be a 10 minute break halfway through. Um, first of all, Dr. Wilson will discuss how to recognize the symptoms of OCD, and we hope we'll debunk a few of the myths that often exist around OCD. And then Catherine will share her lived experience of OCD, which um, when I've heard Catherine speak is a really inspirational story. Um, so we're very much looking forward to hearing from both of our speakers. We'll then have a 10 minute break, after which there will be a Q&A and both um, Rob and Catherine have very kindly said that um, they will stay for the Q&A at the end. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask either of our speakers, you can do that using the Q&A function, which is kind of at the bottom of the screen. So if it hasn't appeared for you already, if you kind of move your mouse around, it should pop up. And it's next to the chat function. So the chat's already got a couple of things in it. The Q&A function, I don't think will appear as having anything in it. And you can ask your question in there. It might not appear for everybody else to see, but there are people kind of in the team behind the scenes that are gonna put the questions together. And then I will share those with Catherine and Rob at the end. We can't promise to get through every question. You might see there's already over 160 people on the call. So if each of you ask a question, we won't get through them all, but we will put forward the kind of most asked questions and the ones most pertinent to tonight's topic. Um, obviously, you can see we're all using a tech platform tonight. If any of you are having any challenges with that, there's an email address in the chat that you can, um, it just has popped up that you can email and ask for some support. Um, and obviously, if we have a big technical issue, we'll do our best to get back online as quickly as we can. So just reuse the link um, that you were sent at the start. Um, you will have seen or maybe heard at the start that this is being recorded. Obviously, none of you are appearing on the screen because we can't see each other. Um, but that does mean that if you need to step away um, at any time for any reason, either because of your own well-being or, I don't know, because the Amazon person arrives, it's absolutely no problem. The um, recording will be online. And we hope within the next week or so, and you'll be sent an email um, to let you know when that happens. So please don't worry if you need to uh, miss any of the content for any reason. Um, just on the note of well-being, obviously, as I said, it's fine to, to step away if you need to. 
And we will also put a link again in the chat um, of where to find more resources from OCD Action if you feel you need more support or information at the end of this, or if you need any more kind of immediate support at the end of the session. We don't expect that would be the case. We're not kind of hoping that anything will be too triggering, but if you do, please do look after yourselves and, and visit some of those resources at the end. Um, I'm going to stop speaking very shortly, so I hope you've all got, and you're going to hear from the people that you came to, to hear speak, um, so I hope everybody's kind of got a cup of tea, and if it's anything like me, when I join a webinar, maybe got your dinner and are sat comfortably. Um, so it's my absolute privilege to um, introduce Dr. Wilson. Um, Rob is a really highly respected clinician um, in the world of OCD, who I've had the privilege to work with before at some of OCD Action's conferences. Um, he's a wonderful speaker, so you will have uh, a great next half an hour as he speaks. Um, he's a cognitive behavioral therapist, um, and he's also an academic and a writer. He's written some wonderful books. If you're looking for somewhere to kind of start with um, understanding a bit more after this, um, he's written Overcoming OCD um, uh, with uh, Professor Veal. He's also written Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Dummies and um, edited a book, Taking Control of OCD, all of which are I would very thoroughly recommend. Um, so I'm not going to speak anymore, but, you know, I know we can't hear you, but do lean in and um, give Rob a massive round of applause. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Rob now. Thank you very much for that lovely uh, introduction, Lee. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining me this evening. Thank you so much to, to OCD Action for inviting me to come and participate in this uh, webinar. Um, really exciting. Uh, always a privilege to be uh, involved with OCD Action. I've known the organisation for uh, for many, many a long year, and uh, you know, really, really admire the work that uh, OCD Action does as an organisation. So, my job this evening is to talk a little bit about um, the nature of OCD, and hopefully a bit about um, some of the myths. And I've already realised that I've missed an important one. I've just made a note about. Um, and just to try and give us a, a sense of clarity um, as much as I can about what is OCD. And uh, as I say, to try and clear up one or two of the uh, myths and misconceptions about the problem. Some of those myths and misconceptions will be aimed at sort of what I understand of being sort of, sort of public uh, misconceptions. And others are perhaps ones that are worth thinking about um, for anyone who has OCD um, themselves. And so this is really aimed at people who are uh, in many ways are newer to the diagnosis of OCD or maybe are beginning to wonder might you have OCD um, and also hopefully to if you've been and it is not unusual in my experience for people as they read and learn and see different clinicians to maybe be given slightly conflicting and frankly sometimes downright unhelpful um, and pessimistic information about the nature of OCD so I'm hoping to clear up um, one or two of those ideas as well. My only plea is if you really do know that you've got OCD or you've been given a clear diagnosis of OCD and you're here wanting to confirm for the umpteenth time that you've got OCD and not something else, I'd be cautious about that because the fact that you might be seeking to check again or wanting reassurance about whether you do or don't have OCD probably is part of, of having OCD. So it's something to try and resist. Um, but that being said, I won't be nagging too much this evening, I hope. Um, so let, let's let's press on and, and talk a bit about what this is. Um, and as you probably know, uh, OCD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And that means you have um, obsessions and or compulsions. And most commonly in OCD, people have both. Um, and I'm going to walk you through some of the diagnostic criteria of um, OCD derived from the world, the World Health Organization's uh, text, which ICD-11, which is the International Classification of Diseases uh, version 11. Um, so we'll say a little bit more about what they tell us OCD is um, in a few moments. 
And a brief reminder, OCD affects around one in every 100 people, so what about 1% of the population, although I sometimes wonder if that's a relatively conservative estimate. Um, and of course, one of the really important things to remember about OCD, and one of the reasons it's so important to try and help people with OCD, is it's often not just the individual who suffers greatly as a result of the problem, of course, um, but it also has a big impact on the people that are around them, the people who live with them and care for them and so on. Um, so I often say that each time we help someone recover from OCD, we're probably also helping a number of people around them. Um, so it's a common problem and uh, it can have a very far reaching implications. So what are obsessions? By definition, according to ICD-11, obsessions are repetitive and persistent thoughts and or images and or impulses and urges. So impulses meaning that sense that you, you fear that you might want to or be about to do something. Um, and they come into your mind and into your body in an unwanted way, that they intrude. Um, and they're most commonly associated with emotions like anxiety. But um, we also know that in truth, people experience lots of other emotions like disgust, shame, uh, guilt, and so on. And oftentimes other emotional problems like depression will accompany OCD. So it's actually, it's not just an anxiety disorder. OCD is quite, a, um, can, can trigger a range of different emotions. Um, and importantly, what's happening is that the individual who has the intrusive thoughts and images and so on, they're trying to ignore them, they're trying to suppress them. So these aren't obsessions in the same way that I have an obsession about pizza, meaning I'm always thinking about pizza because I want to think about pizza um, and how I might, might get my hands on pizza or how I might, might make another pizza. Um, these aren't wanted thoughts, these are thoughts on that people are trying to get rid of them, trying to get rid of, push the thoughts out of their minds by maybe neutralizing thoughts or performing other kinds of compulsions. And I'll talk a bit about, about compulsions in just a moment. So compulsions are repetitive behaviors or rituals, including mental acts. And that's really important in relatively recent years, uh, more light has been shone upon the fact that people don't just carry out compulsions in their behavior they also carry out compulsions in their in their minds and we in a way we used to think that this was probably maybe true of OCD but less true of other disorders but in fact what's happening in across uh, the field of psychology and psychiatry is we're learning a lot more about the kind of mental acts that people carry out um, in their minds because of course we have inner thoughts and inner dialogues and where we place our attention and reminding ourselves of things and reviewing things in our minds so there's lots it's really important to be aware of not only the overt compulsions and rituals that people carry out but also the what are called covert um, compulsions and these are things that people feel are driven to perform in reaction to in response to the obsession and they're often applied according to, to rigid rules um, and sometimes they're they're there to try and make things feel more complete. So that might be making things feel more just so, but very often what compulsions are about is they're there to provide some kind of relief from discomfort. Um, if I feel anxious that I maybe have run so on over in my car, if I retrace the journey and double check that I can't see any evidence of an accident, I might feel some sense of relief that I haven't caused harm or I might um, wash my hands when I when my hands feel contaminated somehow and again I might do that until I feel some sense of relief but the problem is um, that of course that relief tends to be temporary and tends to rather reinforce those actions so we come back around again to have to do it again on another another day or sometimes in another minute um, so examples here of overt behaviors things like repetitive washing um, cleaning surfaces maybe, repeated checking behaviours, classically things like checking are the doors locked or is the gas cooker off or as I say did I accidentally bump into that person maybe on the street, um, reassurance seeking, 
um, repeatedly asking questions. Uh, is, is a certain thing safe? Is it okay that I did this? Is it okay that I didn't do this? And um, uh, things like ordering objects, uh, making, again, rearranging items in one's home, um, in one's wardrobe, in the kitchen, on the desk, um, until things to feel kind of just so or feel feel right or safe. Um, examples of mental actions, including uh, repeating specific phrases. Um, so it might be um, that again, I've, I fear that my kids are going to uh, come to harm when they're out playing and I might have an intrusive thought of them being abducted by uh, a pedophile and I might say to my mind, in my mind, safe, 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 or I might replay an image of them being okay. And so, so the, the idea is there that I'm using a mental action to try and prevent something bad from happening. Or, and this is a really common uh, mental action, is things like reviewing and replaying. And that might be that I'm retracing and replaying the steps that I, of things that I've touched if I felt my hands were dirty. So I'm just checking in my mind that having taken my shoes off at the door, I'm trace. So I would have wanted this carefully when I did it, but I might also sit down on the sofa and then retrace and, and check to see whether I did indeed avoid touching certain surfaces and I careful about the sequence of events of things I've touched. Um, or it might be um, I've been out of my car and I've had that thought about causing harm, causing an accident or hitting a cyclist or something. And I'm then lying in bed reviewing the uh, memories that I've got of that journey. Uh, and one of the interesting things about OCD is that the, the scope of these um, mental and um, overt behaviors is extremely broad. Um, and sometimes people might do things like mentally count objects. Again, sometimes that might be for superstitious reasons or trying to ward off threats or trying to make sure that I only land on certain safe numbers and not on unsafe numbers. But the key thing is that these are predominantly, they're kind of, they're emotional actions, if you like. They are, they're things that are mainly driven to try and make myself feel some relief, make myself feel as if things are safer in some way. Um, and provide some uh, reduction in discomfort. But they're not normally that realistically connected to um, a feared event, or the if they if it does make sense, perhaps that I would want to wash my hands before eating after I've just handled very dirty looking shoes. Um, sometimes in OCD, those that hand washing might become very excessive and long in duration. It might involve excessive quantities of cleaning products and, and disinfectants and things. So it's if it if it does logically link to preventing a fear, it's often become out of control and, and, ex, and uh, excessive. But what's really important is that um, this stuff isn't fun for anybody, and it's causing significant levels of distress. Um, and it's interfering in people's life. And one of the interesting things to think about when people um, witter on about the idea that you, uh, you know, they may be a little bit OCD is to help them to understand that, well, that's you no, know, a, a little bit OCD, you know, avoiding tre treading on cracks in pavements, throwing salt over your shoulder, liking your items in your cupboard being just so, they don't count. As, as OCD because they're not even a little bit OCD. They may be a little bit of an you know, a habit or something slightly superstitious, but OCD lasts for at least an hour a day. And of course, most people are engaged in worries and compulsions for several hours a day, if not you know, sometimes almost all of the day. Um, and they're causing clinically significant distress, great levels of pain, suffering, anxiety, worry, shame, guilt, and so on, as I've said. Um, and really importantly, they're not only causing the person distress, they're nearly always interfering in one's ability to uh, 
look after um, the family, um, maybe carry out certain personal care tasks even, um, be able to work, uh, seek further education, uh, socialising, hobbies, interests, you name it. If it's important to you, OCD will oftentimes try and ruin it. Um, and there are people, I'll mention this again later on, that, that manage to keep going in various ways and you know, keep looking after the family or keep managing to turn up at work and so on. But very often this means they're, they're trying extremely hard, they have to work really hard uh, to push through all of their pain and suffering and, and discomfort and having to squeeze in sometimes uh, compulsions and, and navigate carefully around the world, avoiding certain triggers and difficulties. Um, so this is a this is a really a seriously disruptive disorder, and I can't stress that enough. This isn't um, a light and fluffy kind of condition. This is a as bad as it gets, extremely damaging, very disruptive kind of problem, and. There are very few mental health problems that are as disruptive as, as OCD can be when it's at its worst. So I'll talk a little bit about um, next about some of the more common myths and misconceptions in OCD. As I say, some of these myths and misconceptions will be more, uh, what I would imagine to be in the mind of the public, and some of these myths and, myths and misconceptions will be um, in perhaps in the mind of the individual with OCD, and I think all of them are worth worth thinking about. So OCD is just a minor problem. It's all hand washing and straightening pencils. I became I became unnecessarily irate the other day when I found a textbook that had images of um, pencils being slightly out of line. As I thought it was rather necessary to perpetuate such a stereotype of, of OCD. And this is definitely one of the challenges with OCD. It does have, in, in many ways, not, it's not so true of problems like panic disorder or social phobia, maybe, um, the, where there are these kind of archetypical sort of stereotypes around. But OCD is way beyond, for some individuals, hand washing is part of it, but that will be an extreme, um, oftentimes, level of hand washing and we're part of a, a pattern of, of avoidance and other safety mechanisms the person has to use um, and it may be uh, strengthening pencils but it, again it's unlikely that's all it's going to be because to qualify as OCD it's going to have to involve a lot of time spent on uh, different kinds of compulsions and a uh, lot the even if it is strengthening pencils which it very rarely is in my experience it's going to be incredibly uh, distressing and time consuming. So it's it's not just that, and people can't just pull themselves together. There's a huge range of different kinds and shapes and forms of OCD. Um, and, as, and as we've already seen, it causes great stress, has huge impact. And importantly, we know it's all very well saying that people should just stop it or pull themselves together. The key thing is that people already with OCD are already trying very hard anyway. Um, it's just that these the strategies they're using may not be working to resolve their OCD properly or, or fully. Um, and what OCD action brings to the table and hopefully um, therapists like myself will try and bring to the table is helping people to have a better understanding of what to try and change and, and how to try and approach the problem differently. And this is a list of just some of the different forms of OCD. Um, and hopefully many of the people that are attending this evening will, 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 will see their OCD represented. But it's also important to say that OCD doesn't stay in its lane, that um, oftentimes over a, a period of years, the, in, within an individual, the kind of OCD that they have will, will change. Um, so it is quite important to try and understand OCD in general, not just a specific kind of OCD. Um, and by no means is this an exhaustive list because OCD doesn't care. It can, it will change, it will morph, it will find some new and interesting way of um, focusing itself upon, upon particular worries and troubles and anxieties. Um, and so at sometimes you'll find that you are plagued by particular kinds of in difficult intrusive thoughts and you are making efforts to try and get rid of them. You are carrying out certain kinds of compulsions and avoidance behaviors. 
but you may not be able to find that with your particular thoughts written down in a book or on a particular website and I wouldn't worry too much about that I would try and focus on the uh, general concepts and principles about how, how OCD works not get too hung up on specific kinds um, but these days we're certainly seeing a lot more people who worry about things like what they call POCD uh, people worrying about um, maybe there's some evidence that they've got some unhealthy interest in children um, oh, and we're I think interestingly the relationship OCD has come more to light um, we have uh, you know classics like contamination OCD and fears of causing harm which lead to people checking things um, but you name it there's there's lots and lots and lots of different kinds and different shapes and sizes of OCD um, all of which it's important to say can be overcome So here's a here's a misconception. I uh, probably um, not every clinician would agree with me that this is necessarily a, a myth or a misconception. But um, I the idea that OCD is a neurological or brain problem, and the, one of the difficult implications of this is that therefore only a physical treatment will help. But it strikes me that um, all human life is takes place in our brain to some extent or another. Um, and the idea that OCD is uniquely kind of neurological or brain related, I think is possibly a bit old fashioned. I think it's partly based on the idea that because people originally found some of the, the worries, the fears, the obsessions, and some of the compulsions in OCD so strange, and people finding it such a hard fight, people finding it so difficult to stop themselves, the assumption was that this must be a kind of neurological brain problem. But the evidence doesn't really stack up on this. And we've, if you look at people like Adam Adomsky and some of his work on OCD, it seems to be quite possible to engender OCD type experiences like a doubt in um, one's uh, judgment and lack of, a lack of confidence in knowing that things are safe by asking people to do repeated checking. So, it would seem more likely that there are strong psychological processes at play behind OCD that of course are taking place in the brain and um, no doubt if you look after your brain well and some people find adding medications really do help a lot um, with their OCD that certainly helping the brain to be in good condition will help recovery but the idea that that necessarily means that this is a a brain problem and therefore OCD is different I think is is erroneous and oftentimes not that helpful and there's certainly good evidence that uh, approach psychological approaches like CBT um, particularly CBT that focuses on exposure and response prevention but they're helpful for OCD and you can kind of think of of things like CBT as being a kind of physiotherapy for the brain by doing your exposures and repeatedly facing your fears and deliberately stopping and cutting back and stopping compulsions you are and anyone that's done it will tell you that it is very effortful, feels like a lot of work, and it is very much like kind of putting your brain through a training through, through a kind of physiotherapy. One of the myths that I still hear, not infrequently from uh, people that I see and work with, is that they've been told by um, a GP or a psychiatrist um, that they've got OCD but they need to be realistic that it's something that you can't recover from it's something you've just got to learn to live with um, but this definitely is not true what is true is you have to try and learn to break break down which aspects of this problem you can solve and change and which aspects you can't and part of breaking free from OCD is understanding this but if you do figure out how to um, learn to allow thoughts and doubts and so on to take place and take care of themselves um, and you don't try and resist your thoughts and push them out and use lots of checking and neutralizing and so on then things very much can change. Um, 
and recovery most definitely is possible. There'll be plenty of people who are, who are participating in part of OC Action who will be able to tell you this. Um, and I've seen in my career, I've had the good fortune to work with a number of people who have um, made a great recovery. Um, it's not always possible to change overnight, that's for certain, and it's certainly not always possible to get completely free from all trappings of, of compulsions or avoidance, but a lot of people could make a great deal of improvement. Um, and as I say, that's really about learning to separate out that which you can change and that which you can't. So you can't stop having doubts, you can't stop having intrusive thoughts, you can't stop the fact that some things in life are a bit risky and it's sometimes not entirely clear how you're going to prevent all these risks. But you can change how you re react to those experiences. And as you cut back on avoidance and cut back on compulsions um, and learn to build up your tolerance of uncertainty and so on, um, things will definitely improve. One of the other things that really, um, really kind of makes my teeth itch a bit about um, the kinds of things I hear people talk about um, OCD is, is the idea that this is sort of like a, a, a defining trait, that this is sort of what having OCD is, it's, it's what you're about as a person. And therefore, by definition, you won't live a normal life. You won't just be able to do the kinds of things that other people do. But it's clearly nonsense. For a start, OCD is, is an illness that, that, that an individual suffers from, and it isn't everything the person is about. They've got lots of other values and drives and hopes and dreams and personality traits, um, and those other parts of the person will guide a lot of the other of that person's activities and daily daily experiences. And as we've already seen in the diagnostic criteria, it is the case that um, many people can live a, a normal life, but it does mean a lot of work. And oftentimes in the service of, say, managing to keep a household running, a relationship going, keep working or something, or managing to continue with education, that means that other things are suffering, but not that if OCD is consuming a lot of time and energy there is only ever going to be 24 hours in the day and some areas of the person's life will be suffering so it's not black and white um but it certainly is the case that many people with ocd are living very um uh productive lives and are making great contributions to society uh people with maternal ocd oftentimes you know, these are these are these are mothers who have ocd they're being great mums they're just suffering a lot and they're not able to relax and enjoy themselves and see their friends so much because so much of their energy is going into keeping uh, their baby safe or trying to neutralize and get rid of certain unwanted thoughts and so on. So it's not the case that people can't at all live a normal life. Sometimes it's affected, um, but it's once, once you learn how to overcome OCD, because there's so many other things about you, there's every reason to assume that you can live a very full life. So this set of myths is 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 um, more thoughts I've had about or than I've just had that the literature has about more of the internal uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions that are important to understand in OCD. And one of the key uh, myths and misconceptions that people have internally in OCD is that somehow the, the, the intrusive thoughts that you're having mean something. A thought of harming yourself harming a loved one, harming a child, um, uh, the idea that you might have accidentally passed on a contaminant. The I, that the, one of the key problems in OCD is, this, is the idea that these, these thoughts and images and urges are much more significant than they really need to be. And so people worry that maybe if I have an intrusive thought about causing harm to someone, this is somehow, this is my unconscious, this is my underlying fantasies are coming to the fore. This is telling me something really dark about myself. Well, this is just a thought. It's just everybody has intrusive thoughts. And every time that's been investigated, that idea, when we've looked at um, 
do individuals who don't have OCD have the same kinds of thoughts that people do when they have OCD? The answer, of course, is yes. There is a difference in the frequency and the intrusiveness, the amount of distress, because clearly having OCD is different than the state of not having OCD, but it's not the concept of the thoughts that's the issue. And one of the differences between people with OCD and those without is that people without OCD are generally less focused on their inner world, they're perhaps um, less likely to misinterpret a certain kind of in, an intrusive thought. Um, so can we just go back, Carol, just one step? Thank you very much. So yes, so the, the misinterpretation is the idea that these thoughts are somehow revealing you as being bad or dangerous, that they're, 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 they're maybe the, the fear is that now that I've had the thought that uh, the, that, that um, my electrics in the house may cause a fire or that um, I'm going to, if I don't let check that tap, it's going to leak and then it's going to cause harm to the building and then that will cause harm to the person living beneath me. Um, and the, one of the other big problems in OCD is the, is the misinterpretation that because it's, this thought has occurred to me, it now means I'm responsible to do something to prevent it. Whereas in fact, you have, you have ideas and thoughts and images and, and, and mental experiences pop in and out of your mind all of the time. The problem in OCD is that somehow you've got caught up in the trap of being focused too much on certain kinds of thoughts and engaged into in trying too hard to get rid of them in some way. So what do these intrusive thoughts really reveal? Well, they tend to reveal the not that you want to harm someone or that you uh, want to cause harm to yourself in some way. They, they reflect the, the, the things you're afraid you might do or the things you're afraid might happen to the people that you care about. And why are they so intense and so strong? Well, they partly because you really, really don't want these things to happen and partly because of the impacts of, of the compulsions that you've been carrying out around them. Um, it probably tells you, if it tells you anything, that you're a rather responsible kind of person, you might be prone to a bit of overthinking at times, and it may also tell you that you may be a bit intolerant to some kinds of doubts and ambiguity. Um, but this is, a, this is a person who is um, a generally a good and kind and decent human being that's being played by difficult and unpleasant intrusive thoughts. The intrusive thoughts are precisely bothering you so much because of you being what they used to call in the old the old fashioned literature of tender conscience. Um, so it's not that the fear of causing harm means that this is something that you're likely to do. It means actually probably you're rather sensitive to those kinds of thoughts and you're probably trying too hard to avoid that harm or get rid of those thoughts. And the point is your mind is very good at providing images and ideas, um, but it's just the same as everybody else's. And so think about OCD as a problem partly of trying too hard to protect yourself, to get rid of unwanted thoughts and images and urges, or trying too hard to protect people that you care about or you see as, see as vulnerable in some way. Flip side of this is, once you've um, begun to carry out certain compulsions to try and get rid of certain thoughts, once that's become a habit, it can then become a kind of decision to stop getting rid of these intrusive thoughts. And then what happens is people have um, misunderstandings about what that means. So that if I don't try and get rid of this thought, I might fear that I'm somehow increasing the risk of but if I don't neutralize that image of my children burning to death in the car, that might be increasing the risk of it happening. Maybe I'll worry that if I stop neutralizing my thoughts about being a pedophile, that somehow means I'm, I don't care, or even that now I want it to happen. And then people, this happens in treatment, but sometimes when people become less anxious or less distressed about their intrusive thoughts, they then misinterpret that reduction in distress as now oh, I'm becoming a bit of a psychopath because I don't worry about this so much anymore. Then my loser on moral compass, does this mean I'm, I've, I've now, I'm, I, if I just dismiss these thoughts, if I just treat them like they're non-events, non does this mean I'm, I'm no longer really trying so hard? 
but it doesn't. It just means that you're a regular person letting things pass. Does it mean I'm failing if I'm not trying hard enough? If I, another misinterpretation might be, if I don't find a solution to this worry or a solution to this doubt or a solution to this thought, maybe it will never go away and then I'll never be free from it. But in fact, if you don't try hard to get rid of your intrusive thoughts, it just means you're acting like everybody else. It means you're responding appropriately to a normal mental event. And, in, and if you're, just because you're not taking action to try and prevent harm that's just occurred to you, if you're not taking action to prevent the fire or prevent the gas explosion or prevent the person from being harmed in different ways, it doesn't mean it's, your same, it's like you're saying it's okay if it happens. It doesn't mean that you're um, morally responsible for it happening. It just means you're letting the thought pass. It means that you, you come to understand that intrusive thoughts reflect the things that you fear, but they don't really have a great deal of significance or responsibility other than reflect the things that you fear. It shows that you'll be following your values, looking after yourself and the people you care about in other ways, not getting sucked into seeking relief from temporary relief from discomfort by using avoidance or compulsions. It means you're looking after yourself and other people by looking after your health. By you can be good at looking after yourself, making a contribution to the world, making a contribution to your life with others by providing a healthy version of yourself that isn't distracted, that isn't overly burdened with stress and worry. And you're trusting that the thoughts will fade away of their own accord. And this is a big test for a lot of people, a big experiment to check out that if I have an unwanted intrusive thought or image, if I don't do anything about it, actually, if I don't focus on it, and I move, bring my attention to the world around me, eventually that thought will fade. They all will fade. All thoughts will fade if you're not focusing upon them. And over time, the idea is that you become more tolerant of doubt and uncertainty, and you build up more confidence in making your own mind up about whether things are safe or unsafe, whether it's reasonable to just leave things and not double check them, because you, you become more tolerant of, of doubt, but at the same time, you become more able to think that you really know what's right, what's, what's appropriate. One of the things that people often say about um, when we, we try and have that conversation with people about uh, intrusive thoughts being normal and images being normal is that people will say yeah yeah image thoughts maybe are okay but what surely if i'm getting a bodily sensation a certain response to my body or i'm getting strong emotions or even if i'm not getting quite the right kind of emotions that must mean that something bad is going on what this tends to mean is that people we've, we've probably in the um in the literature and as clinicians we've probably slightly um, oversimplified things by just talking about intrusive thoughts being normal, whereas in fact we mean thoughts, images and urges and, and oftentimes that comes with body sensations of feeling like you might be out about to act upon something, a bit like that experience when you're in a uh, funeral and you feel like you're about to stand up and say something inappropriate, or people that when they're standing on, they've got fear of heights, they're standing on a tall building, they feel like they're about to throw themselves off the tall building, it's not just a thought, it's a it's a multi-sensory experience. But the, so first understand that it, when we're saying intrusive thoughts, it does in fact mean much more than that. And secondly, be careful not to tune into your body to check whether you're getting the right kind of emotional reactions or checking to see that you're not getting any physical reactions that are in line with your fears, you know, not any urge to pick up the knife and, or any inappropriate feelings uh, or body sensations towards children if you've got um, paedophile focused OCD. Because the more you zero in on those things, the more chances are you'll find anomalies or things that don't feel quite right. And so the, the issue here is you go, if you look, go looking for trouble, you will find it. So keep your attention externalized and let those experiences just pass to their own accord. An oldie but a goldie, uh, of a doubt about OCD is the idea if I've got what's called um, puro, meaning I haven't got any physical compulsions, then treatment won't work for me. And what oftentimes is happening here is that people are missing that they in fact do have a number of different compulsions um, and responses to their obsessions. So if this is a concern that you don't think you have many or any compulsions, 
check for those mental compulsions that we mentioned earlier on, but also look out for anything that's a bit of a subtle avoidance, things that you're a little bit more careful of than other people. Do you Google other search engines that are available uh, on this particular subject? Are you a bit more of an expert on the area of your fear than the average person on the street? Do you find yourself mentally reviewing? Do you find yourself um, ruminating and overthinking on things? Do you carry out sort of subtle checks? And here the devil's in the detail. So look out for those mental compulsions and look out for subtle and um, not the kind of cla you know, maybe classic compulsions that you'd expect, but are there subtle ways in which you might tune into a body sensation that you, are you just having a little glimpse of something out of the corner of your eye? So look out for the devil being in the detail. When people are seeking help, sometimes what they're looking for is actually a better way to try and get rid of their thoughts or doubts. And it can sometimes be a bit of a disappointing conversation for people that actually that's not the aim of treatment. The aim of treatment is to find a better way of relating to um, your thoughts and doubts and images and urges. But if you relate to them differently, then they will start to settle down and things will begin to pass. So, Having OCD doesn't mean that you're not trying hard enough. It means you're already trying too hard to avoid risk or to keep things clean or to try and get rid of those intrusions or try and feel just right or to have things just so. The solutions are the problem. So the aim in the game is to try a little bit less hard and work towards focusing on how you want to live your life but without compulsions and avoidance interfering with it. So are there OC two other important myths here, are there overcoming OCD is easy, so you can just stop it, or overcoming OCD is so hard it's impossible. Well, of course, neither of those things is true. Um, improving your mental health is very much like improving any other aspects of your health. You need to understand how OCD works, so oftentimes understanding that the volume knobs on backwards and the trying to suppress thoughts makes them louder and more intrusive, that checking reduces confidence that things are in your memory, for example, um, checking reduces your tolerance for uncertainty and so on. So you need to understand that the volume knob is on backwards. But once you've understood that, that isn't the beginning, that isn't the end of the process. You've, once you know the muscles you've got to develop, then it's about applying daily and putting yourself through the right kinds of exercises, refocusing retention, exposure response prevention, changing relationship and normalizing um, on, on unwanted thoughts. So it's like getting fitter and flexible in, in as you would do in your physical health. You've got to think about that OCD won't just stop because you understand it. It's once, once you've had it for a few months, it's become part of your habit mechanism. So you've got to keep persistently countering avoidance and countering those compulsions. So it's gonna take time and persistence um, and you may well need some help and support and guidance. You might start with a website, you might start with a self-help book, you might move on to some support groups, you might seek out some professional help. Um, but once you understand how to work on OCD and you put in the time and effort, you get very, very likely to get good results and that is most definitely going to be worth it. And that's the, all I have for me at this stage. Huge thank you to, the, to you, Rob. That was um, wonderful. Um, I think it was, it was wonderful how you used such specific examples to talk through some really um, complex ideas. And, um, and I think you gave us such hope, actually. Um, about what the future could look like for, I think, many of the people listening. So um, thank you ever so much. And just a reminder to everybody listening that, um, as I said at the start, Rob has really kindly said that he will um, stay for the Q&A. So if you've got any questions for Rob, do add them into the Q&A um, by just typing into the box that is at the bottom of the um, the screen and um, I, I know he can't um, hear us all but just a huge thank you to Rob that was absolutely wonderful and um, and I know we all just want to say a massive thank you to him. Um, we're gonna take a um, 
I was going to say we're going to take a short break. We're not. We're moving on to Catherine um, Benfield now. And um, many of you might know Catherine better from her social media feed, um, which is Taming Olivia, where she talks a lot about um, her lived experience of OCD and her recovery. And when she's not doing that, Catherine is on the um, film circuit promoting a film that she has worked really hard on, Waving, which um, explores the experience of OCD and intrusive thoughts. And she worked on that film with the now movie star, Ralph Inns, and um, and that film is doing really well. So I'd really encourage you to look out for that when it's on public release. Um, and so I am really excited that Catherine is here to share her story with us because it is such an inspiring and hopeful story. So I will pass over to Catherine now. And as I said with Rob, even though we can't see you all, it does make a huge difference. Um, I think the way we listen as an audience. So I just encourage everybody to give Catherine a massive round of applause and uh, lean in and listen well. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, OCD Action, thank you so much for having me. Um, I love you. And I want to say a big thank you to Rob. Um, I, had, I did send him a message saying this, but actually when I was first diagnosed with OCD and I was in an absolute pit, I had no idea how I was going to climb out of it. Um, I read his book and I watched his things online and it was incredible. So it's a real honour um, to be able to present beside him today. Um, Rob, you will never know how much you helped me, my goodness. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences with OCD and then I'm going to go on to kind of also cover some of the stuff that Rob did about, um, you know, myths about OCD, but how to spot compulsions and things like that, because actually I have had OCD probably from about the age of five. Um, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 32 when I was just so ill after having my son and I went through about a year of having perinatal OCD without realizing that's what it was um, and something like this talk here would have just been absolutely wonderful for me to find um, so I'm really glad everyone here has found it um, I have I'll talk a bit more about my OCD experiences as I go through but I mean I'd just like everyone to remember that you know, the focus of what I'm talking about today is kind of spotting compulsions and things like that and I do cover how difficult things have been but just keep in the back of your mind that I'm actually right now in the best place that I've ever been in my life. Um, I am saying yes to opportunities now or doing things that I never in a million years thought I would. And I actually think my life is like a thousand times richer now than it was before. You know, the therapy that I've been through, the work that I've done, all of those things have helped me with other bits of my life, you know, like losing my parents, grief, stress. So although I would never go so far as to say that I'm glad I have OCD, you know, I, I want to hear people when I hear they say that, but um, I can sit here and say to you that I've never been in a better position of my life. So when I talk about some of the more difficult compulsions and more difficult times I went through, please just remember that. Um, so, yeah, let's get going. Um, the, so the OCD cycle, this was something, I mean, Rob obviously talked about this in a lot of detail. I'm not a professional. Um, I'm a, well, I'm a primary school teacher, so um, I'm very good at reading off slides, but I'm this, you know, this isn't my field. But the OCD cycle, so I had no idea that what I was doing kind of involved a loop of these behaviours. Um, I had absolutely no idea. Uh, and this is, you're talking two decades of my life, three decades of my life. I didn't know this. And I think if I had, it would have made life so much easier. You know, the idea that you have your fears, your obsessions, these things that feels like impulses and urges, they then create this anxiety, you then have to carry out these actions or mental, you know, reviews or behaviours to lessen the relief. I didn't know how it all works. I had absolutely no idea. I didn't know how many different types of compulsions there were. I didn't have a clue that, um, the compulsions could also be internal or like mental rituals that you just literally couldn't see from outside. I also didn't know that everything was being driven by obsessions. You know, I just thought 
I knew about the behaviors I was doing. I knew that I was, there were certain things I was doing that was quite odd um, and people couldn't quite work out why I was doing them. I did a really good job of trying to hide some of the stuff, um, an amazingly good job as well, considering how young I was with some of it. But, you know, people, I think people just thought it was a bit of a quirk, a little bit odd. And so did I, because no one really realized all the stuff that was driving it. They didn't realize this endless loop that I was um, kind of going through. So just to talk a little bit about how, again, I had no idea about this loop that I was doing. I had no idea I had OCD, but my OCD started, I remember being very young and being absolutely convinced that my family um, were going to die, basically. Something was going to happen to them. Um, and it was horrendous. I mean, it kind of got worse as I got older and I kind of, I, I was aware of just how much can go wrong to a parent, you know. And I really stuck on this one idea about my mum dying in a car crash on the way home from work. You know, it was never just a prang. It was never just a burst tyre. It was always just... It was always that she would die and that she would leave me. It was horrendous. So I had these obsessions, these thoughts. And again, I didn't realise it was the thoughts driving it at the time. And I just remember feeling really sick. I, and I used to start off feeling a bit nervous at around one, two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd come home from school. And then as it got nearer four, which she was a teacher, that was the time she used to come in. I'd feel worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And the way I tried to deal with this, again, I didn't realise that's what I was trying to do. But I would wait at the window, willing her to come home. And I do remember sometimes kind of almost whispering things to myself, trying to make sure. I mean, I'm not sure. I I must have known at some level, maybe not at that age, that, you know, no matter how much I whispered, it wasn't going to stop crash. It wasn't going to stop someone who might have had a drink before they got in the car. Or maybe my mum was tired and she wasn't focusing properly on on the road. You know, it, it just seemed to be the only thing that helped me to feel better. and. So I used to feel I used to do that. And then obviously I used to feel so much relief when I used to see her. And, you know, Rob talked about the impact on family. And I can't help but think as an adult looking back now, just the impact that would have had on my mum. She's finished a hard day at work. And the first thing she sees when she turns onto her road is this ashen daughter just glued to the window, you know, waiting for her to come home. And again, it used to get worse, you know, so it never really stayed at that. It used to be, oh, you know, we were going to, that she's going to burn, something happened to her at night, the house will catch on fire, someone's going to come and burgle us, you know, they're not just going to take the TV, they're going to kill us all. And I would develop these kind of compulsions to help me deal with it. And they changed, you know, sometimes they were checking the cooker, sometimes they were checking the lock. And really, I remember being about eight or nine years old and really quite poorly um I couldn't really I couldn't really do very much at all um I was somehow managing to still go to school school didn't know about it but you know it would take me three to four hours to go to sleep every night and stuff and it was the 80s so I think people were a bit worried about talking about it um you know in case you know stigma kind of affected me or I you know I think my mum was really worried that it would affect me you know I'd be labeled um and next one please Cara and as I got a little bit older um <laughs> I mean, somehow I think about this and I look back, I don't know how I did it. I managed to go through my GCSEs, my A-levels. I mean, we say go through, it was difficult. Um, I constantly had like the leech of OCD kind of sucking me dry of energy. Um, but I went through university and I became a primary school teacher. And I remember like it was very full on. It was very, very busy. So I was always really, um, I did manage to stay quite focused on my job. Um, but I used to have this really, I used to have this thing where I'd be driving home from school and I would get these intrusive thoughts that I'd left the um, computer on and the, the computer was going to like explode during the night. It would take the whole school with it. You know, the caretaker would die. I mean, I don't know what he'd be doing there at two o'clock in the morning, but this is kind of how irrational these things can be. And I remember it just being so horrendous. And I was driving, you know, and I remember the anxiety used to affect my vision. And I used to think, you know, I used to wrestle with this thought, should I go back? Should I not go back? What am I going to do? And nine times out of 10, I would have to go back and I would have to check that this computer was undone. And I wouldn't just check it. I'd have to actually like undo the lead, tie it around something so that I kind of had this mental image of me actually doing it. I was more likely to remember it if I'd manipulated the wire in some way. And of course, then... I'd carry on around the, uh, the loop, I'd feel relief, I'd be halfway home again, and I'd feel the urge to go back again. 
And again, like it never dawned on me that this didn't make sense, you know, that probably the majority of the teachers in school were leaving school at the end of the day, letting their computers just go to sleep so they can turn them on in the morning rather than turning them off properly at the wall. It didn't, you know, I used to worry that that one computer being left on to sleep would damage the planet irreparably overnight. You know, what about the fact that I'd have to turn my car back and drive extra miles? You know, so it was almost like it wasn't irrational um, sometimes. And sometimes I knew that but it wasn't enough to stop me doing it. It was that constant, like, what if? Um, and then as I got even older, um, this is where OCD really uh, knocked me for six. And I actually, I became incredibly, incredibly ill. Um, I was a shadow of my former self, um, really. And this was 10 years ago now. So I had a little boy in 2012. Um, I had a very healthy pregnancy. Um, almost as soon as he was born I started to get again I didn't know they were intrusive thoughts I didn't know I had OCD and I didn't know about this cycle I started to get really horrible concerns that's how I saw them as worries or concerns that my son was going to get hurt somehow um, and because it was my boy you know if I thought it had been, I'd been anxious before this took it to a whole new level you know very quickly I was experiencing full-on panic attacks I wasn't eating I wasn't sleeping um, and I would try to do things that would keep him safe and some of them you could kind of see a bit of sense behind and others just none at all so one of the things I became first obsessed about was the idea that um, the house the chemicals in the cleaning um, products in the house would somehow hurt him now I can see that they you know you've got to be careful around chemicals and babies and stuff like that but I mean realistically you need sterilization fluid you know and my husband had to do that because I wouldn't have any part of that and stuff and and I chucked out all the cleaning products in the house now really this this was a newborn baby the cleaning stuff was up in the high cupboard he wasn't wasn't moving you know the chances of him actually getting somewhere and I don't know pouring stuff on himself was was nil but it wasn't enough for me to want to get them out. But in true OCD style, you know, the relief didn't last very long. And I had, I remember I had this terrible feeling that my beloved cat was gonna sit on the baby and suffocate him. And again, occasionally you hear horror stories, but also it's a good, it's a good idea. It's good hygiene practice not to have a cat near a brand new normal, like baby, especially at night when no one's watching. And so I used to shut him in one room where he had everything he needed. I used to make sure I shut the baby's room, but it was never enough. And I went around that circle over and over again. So I would first of all, shut the door. Then I'd have to get out of bed and check it. So all the time, the intrusive thoughts, because OCD wanted me to attend to this, because it was really concerned that I was, you know, something was gonna happen to my baby. Um, it, it just kept making the thoughts more intense. They would happen more often. The content would become more graphic. You know, it was really trying to get my attention. And it got to the point where actually I started sleeping in with my little boy. It got to the point where I was so worried he was going to stop breathing in the night that I spent every single second of every single night next to his crib watching his chest rise and fall as he was sleeping. So that was the compulsion kind of sitting there and watching him. And the intrusive thoughts were awful. You know, it was like me rushing him to hospital and they were really detailed. It's like my brain knew exactly what to do to get me to attend to them. You know, it really knew what to do to get under my skin. But it actually, it became more severe for me at this point. And this and lack of knowledge of OCD and the way it works actually is what made it so much worse. So I... Um, I started having fears. They kind of got worse and worse and worse. I started worrying other people might accidentally harm him. I started worrying that I might not look after him properly. And then one day I had this really awful feeling. I was sitting on the sofa watching my mother-in-law hold my little baby. And I had this terrible thought that I was going to run up to her, grab the baby and just hit him against the wall. And it felt like Rob said, it felt like an urge or an impulse. You know, my body, my physiology changed. Everything changed. You know, it was just that I really felt like I was going to do it. And it came from nowhere and it changed everything. So as soon as I started having these obsessions about me deliberately harming him, I very quickly got very seriously ill. Um, you know, kind of the panic that I, I couldn't eat at all. I couldn't sleep at all. 
um, I would spend all of my time, I was avoiding him, that was the compulsion. It was like, well, if I'm not safe to be around him, I'm not gonna be near him. And I remember it got to the point where I have a very tall husband, he's six foot three, he's a rugby player, or he used to be a rugby player. And I would only go in the same room as my son, as long as I was over the other side and between us was my husband. That's how convinced OCD made me that I was a risk to my son because I wanted to know that if something happened to me, I lost my mind momentarily and went to hurt my child, that my husband would be able to take me out, you know, like to take me down to stop me doing it. I can talk openly about this now. I understand OCD. I'm really sad it happened to me, um, but I understand it. And I know it was my concern and the fact that, you know, actually I was a really good mum and mums are meant to be focused on risk, but because I'm a bit, because I, you know, I worry a bit and because I have OCD, it's more likely to kind of hit me harder. It's more like I'm going to fiddle with that thought and try and work out what's going on. Um, and I did, I got very well, ill. I actually got to the point where my main compulsion was going to be avoidance. And I was actually thinking about leaving my family. Um, I thought if I'm a risk to my boy, they're going to be better off without me. And I started thinking about kind of leaving the family home because the last thing in the world I wanted to do was risk my little boy. I loved him, you know, so it that's just an example. Again, remember, I went through loads of therapy. I can talk about this now as a way of helping others. And it, it hardly hits home at all. I've talked about it all the time. But and, you know, I'm much better now. But this is an example of how quickly and how devastating OCD can be, you know? Um, and so one of the other things, we go to the next one, Cara, please. Thank you. So I didn't know how to recognize obsessions and compulsions. I had no idea what I was doing. So I've just got a little list here of things that, I mean, I am much better now, but I still can be caught by like this little OCD bug that kind of comes up and comes a knock in. And I tend to be able to bat it away pretty quickly now. But these are just a list of some of the things that I've had a go at over the years, uh, probably quite a go at over the years. So just like things like recognizing obsessions, I tend to know that it's an obsessive thought if I find it upsetting or distressing, or if it's feeding off of doubt, or if it's feeding off of guilt. Um, and very quickly, I will probably become quite preoccupied with that. Um, is it a thought that kind of goes against my values and the things that I hold important? Is it a thought that I find abhorrent and distressing? You know, so that I tend to find that I know I'm entering into the realms of the OCD loop as soon as I start thinking things like that. Um, I also start to notice physiological changes. And so sometimes it can be high, it can be quite difficult to notice obsessions, I, I find particularly if I'm suddenly ensnared in one. Um, but a good way I find of trying to notice is that I'm noticing changes with my body, you know, am I skipping meals? Am I forgetting to drink water? Am I forgetting my, you know, if I exercise, am I forgetting that sometimes? Am I, you know, away with the fairies a little bit? Sometimes I know my son will be like, mom, is that the third time I've called you? You know, so there's little things that kind of might highlight to me that actually something's, knocking for my attention um and is this the start of something you know just so that I can be aware um and also you know is it followed by a compulsion am I doing something am I actually physically moving somewhere or am I um you know maybe trying to wrestle with thought a little bit or trying to neutralize what I'm thinking to make myself feel better so that's the kind of things that I look at with obsessions but again I mean I didn't even know about obsessions until I was 32 um, the, com the compulsions were the things that I did kind of know I was doing. I kind of knew I was doing something when I was looking out the window at my mum and checking the switches and all the other things. That's the first bit I realised uh, was possibly OCD. But so there's a list here. And I mean, like reassurance seeking. I've got another slide on that because that's huge for me. I'm an absolute master at reassurance seeking. I don't think that's a good thing to be. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to take the praise where you can, you know, <laughs> so... I'll talk about reassurance seeking in a minute. Um, checking, again, it's like checking things that I've said to people, checking my memories. My, was my, did I remember that properly? Did that conversation happen the way I think it did? Did I imagine the way they looked at me? You know, what might, what might that have meant? You know, are you sure you're okay with me? Are you sure I didn't upset with I didn't upset you then? Are you sure they said that? You know, so it's constantly trying to kind of prove or find certainty in something. I also, one of the things that really helped me is that, you know, you can only really come into this beat in the OCD loop if you know the compulsions you're doing, if you can recognise them. That's what I always found. And I do 
I do find that I've got these sneaky little things that even sometimes I still do. So ways of making checking more effective. So like I have a way of almost holding my breath when I'm looking at something. Um, I also have a way of kind of staring at something and blinking. And I think it's a strange way of me trying to take a picture of what I'm seeing or like kind of burning the image onto my retina, you know, just something to try and make me even more certain that I've checked something and seen it the way it is. So, you know, it isn't always this great big, you're standing there flicking something or washing your hands or all those other kind of things, or even just standing at the window. Sometimes it is an eye movement or like a breath. And I really realized as soon as I caught myself doing that with my baby gate, I was staring at the baby gate for ages, doing this breathing thing. Like I realized I was doing it so much, you know, so there's a lot of freedom from kind of noticing things like that but I also need to be careful because OCD loves a trap I have to be careful that I'm not kind of then entering the world of over checking myself is this checking for compulsions becoming a compulsion you know so I just have to be really careful um and again I think sometimes thinking why I'm doing something rather than what I'm doing really helps me um monitoring and assessing things looking at things for change keeping an eye on stuff um hunting for certainty I've thought it's about avoidance I am brilliant at avoidance or I was there is absolutely no way I would have done this talk if I was still dealing with the OCD I was a few years ago you know it just anything that scared me or frightened me I would not do it and that doesn't even have to be something like public speaking that can be something like getting on a bus leaving the house having a conversation with my doctor on the phone you know I was so good at that distraction as well I am i Actually, I'm quite proud to admit it. I'm pretty good at computer games. My son is thrilled, absolutely appalled at the same time, because I spent so much of my life dealing with OCD. I distracted myself. And one of the only things that's ever done it successfully is gaming. Um, yeah, I can just put my focus completely in it. And while I'm doing that, I'm not obsessing and I'm not doing compulsions and stuff. That was not healthy. You know, I think had I spent less time gaming, I probably would have tried to get a bit more help first. Again, gaming's awesome. It's a really good well-being activity, but again, it's why you're doing it. Um, rationalizing, trying to wrestle with my thoughts, you know, but that's okay because this happened. But do you really think that was bad? You know, and constant and controlling. You know, how long are we going to be there for? What time are we going to leave? Um, just do you think they're going to bring anything with them? And do you think they'll take their shoes off at the door? I'm going to tell them they need to take their shoes off at the door before they come in. You know, so it's this constant kind of manipulation of events so that you feel in control and just to show you the kind of things that I've done with reassurance seeking so you know I didn't realize how much was re reassurance seeking and literally every single thing on this list I have done um, and I'm sure a lot of you will recognize some of these things as well um, and I also, I wrote a blog once, I did quite a, write, a bit of writing about OCD, and I wrote a blog once and asked people to anonymously share some of the compulsions they do, and the list was like as long as the amount of people who actually wrote in and told me about it, you know, so you do have to kind of keep your wits about you, but things like analysing myself, questioning people, are you sure I didn't upset you? Are you sure that's what that test result said? Could you just check it again for me? You know, it's like constantly trying to find things, tricking others into giving reassurance as well. I got really good at. Um, and I think we do need to be honest about, you know, how sneaky <laughs> sometimes we can be, or OCD can make us. That's a better way of saying it. So I've been known to say to my husband, you know, will you go and get me a drink of water, please? This is a long time ago. Um, and he'll go in and get me a water. It wasn't because I wanted water, it was because. I wanted to know that I was the last one who turned the tap off and I didn't want to have that responsibility of it not still being on. And so by him going in to get that, he is now checked that that isn't on for me. And he's the one who's now carrying the responsibility of being the last one who's turned the, chat, the, turn, turned the tap off. You know, see, it's kind of like it can make some of the things, some of the thinking quite sneaky, you know. So you just, you've just got to be a kind of a little bit wary that that's a possibility as well. Um, I love collecting evidence. You know, I don't love it, but I used to do it a lot. Um, so when I was 15, I was really naughty and um, I made some really bad choices. Therefore, that means I'm quite likely to want to hurt my baby. You know, so it's like or um, another one is my work, which is also on the list. It's like I actually de de um, I dedicate time to people. Um, I try to help them. Therefore, I am not a monster for having these thoughts. You know, so you kind of try and 
you try and reason with yourself you collect evidence to see whether you're guilty or not and things like that and that's never helpful again rumination I can I used to spend hours with that using the internet Facebook professionals advocates chat rooms I mean there is no end especially with the way that social media is now and how many therapists and advocates are very prominent on social media it is incredibly easy to have you know to to get um reassurance you know and again you need to just kind of be aware of whether of why you're doing what you're doing that's what I always find really easy like you know that helps guide me am I finding out about this because it's fact finding for me is this knowledge going to help me with my recovery or am I doing this actually because I want it to lessen my anxiety uh, and in five minutes time I'm going to need to be told again and in five minutes after that I'm probably going to need to be told again you know so asking people things again can be really helpful I, I ask loads of questions I read loads of things I watch loads of things and it's helped me with my recovery no end but I just need to be a little bit aware of when it's kind of stepped away from that fact finding and into the world of trying to get reassurance seeking um I think that's it for that page thank you so my golden rules um there's quite a lot of little golden rules that I've come up with in the year over the years uh just little things that kind of help me catch uh if OCD is coming up again and so I think in my sentence begins with what if or how about or something like that I'm pretty sure I'm dealing with OCD again your average person without OCD starts sentences with what if, um, but I do need to kind of, sometimes it's helpful to, you know, analyze stuff for risk or whatever, just as part of everyday life. But I do need to be very careful when I think I've entered, when I've gone beyond that, you know. Um, if I feel a lot of guilt or doubt, if it starts taking up more time, um, if it starts to make me feel pretty distressed, I know it's probably OCD and that I need to start getting on it. Um, Again, I've said this lots of times, but it's not necessarily what I'm doing. It's why I do it. Uh, you know, so I know that when I spoke to my husband, he said very openly, you know, when I first told him about the worries I was having about my child, about our child, he said that he once had this urge to kind of kick me in the stomach and he just pushed it away. You know, he just didn't think anything else of it. And whereas I kept thinking about it because when it happened to me, because I thought, I was a risk, you know, and I had to keep reviewing it. So it's not necessarily what I'm doing, it's why I'm doing it. What am I hoping to achieve from this behavior? And if it's to lessen anxiety and to make me feel better, chances are, again, it's OCD. Um, being honest and open with myself helps a lot. You know, it's hard to sit there and go, do you know what? Sometimes I can be sneaky to try and get reassurance. It's hard to sit there and say, well, do you know what? I've been in recovery for six years now. I've worked so hard at therapy. I really don't want this to be a setback. I don't want to accept that I'm dealing with this. You know, it will go. I'll just keep really busy. It takes a lot of guts to sit there and go, OK, I know this. I recognise this. It's time for me to have a little think about getting support. Um, and that really helps. You know, it is hard sometimes and it really is. It can be scary. I mean, I had last year the most awful relapse um, where, again, I was like bedridden for a week. It was absolutely horrendous. But again. I picked my, you know, and I picked myself up. That's quite toxic positivity. But, you know, I went, I started therapy again. I went back, meds worked for me. I went back onto medication. You know, my big fat therapy folder came out again. You know, I was really kind to myself. I got, you know, my husband took a week off of work as holiday so that he could help with our son. So it's just being honest with yourself is the, really the first step because that's when you can go out and get help. Um, and then very quickly, we've got just the myths about OCD. How long have I got? So myths about OCD. I know Rob did a brilliant job of talking about these. So I'm just going to say very quickly, OCD is not a fun quirk. It is horrendous. Um, there's So cleaning can or cannot be a part of OCD. I know a lot of people think that OCD is just about cleaning. Um, it's not. But I'm also seeing people, because now there's a real push of people talking about intrusive thoughts and internal compulsions and, you know, the whole idea of pure O, um, and just how graphic and upsetting OCD can be. There are some people on my saying now that OCD is not about cleaning, you know, it's about having thoughts of harming people. So I think, and that's wrong too. OCD could be about, you know, it could be about pretty much anything. It depends on how much distress, how much time and everything, you know. So it's not all about cleaning, but it's also not 
you know, it's also never not about cleaning, if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's, it, there's more gray area about that. Um, OCD is not a positive, positive characteristic. You know, I might have some characteristics that I guess some studies have said that if you combine it with a load of other factors might mean that I'm more likely to have OCD. You know, I'm I'm quite prone to stress. I, I'm quite a perfectionist, something else that I've worked on and stuff, you know, and I've read a few things in the past that says that might mean that I'm I'm more likely, along with other stuff, to develop OCD. But I see those things as being a positive characteristic of me, and I am separate from my from OCD. You know, it's a condition that I have, and I just need to work on it when it flares up again, or sometimes I go years without it. You know, I'm now at a point where I'm living a, a completely normal life, um, thanks to all the work that I've done. You know, I'm not OCD. I'm not OCD at all. No, none of us are. You know, it's just this little something we're having to deal with. The idea that you can be a bit OCD, no. The D is for disorder. Um, a disorder isn't about a bit of anything. And the, that you can be so OCD, you know, so OCD, again, is something that people use um, as a way of kind of almost as a compliment. And I don't know anyone who actually has OCD who will say they're so OCD because they don't want to kind of encourage the use of that term. Um, yeah, so, you know, there, there are loads of myths about OCD, um, but there is something that isn't a myth about OCD. Um, Cara, if we do the next one. And that is that you can go through a truly debilitating and devastating experience with OCD and go on to live a happy, healthy and fulfilled life. Um, honestly, I didn't think I had a future 10 years ago. I didn't want a future. That's how bad I felt. Um, and my life is completely, completely different now. I still have things that I find difficult occasionally. I still, you know, it's life. We all go through things that we find quite difficult. But I have, li I'm living now a life that I would never, ever, ever have dreamed. And I know that I carry with me inside of me a toolbox of things that will help me in any life experience, you know. And that is because I've been through that recovery. And that's because I've gone, I've reached those depths and I've, with help claw my way out you know and that is po totally possible for all of us so even if you're feeling absolutely awful right now um please just know that that's not it you know things do get better they, they really do and that's it from me thank you so much Catherine thank you for being so honest and open and warm and I think thank you so much for being so um clear about what's helped you say say well and um I just think it's been so inspiring okay welcome back everybody um we've got a good range of questions um that have come in on the Q&A so I think um this is this is the moment when we know that everybody has listened wonderfully um, because we've got such wonderful questions. Um, so I think if we're ready, um, I will just kick off with the first question. I think perhaps we'll start with the first question probably for you, Rob. Um, the first question is, why do OCD themes change? And does this mean it's more likely that if my OCD themes change, does this mean it's more likely that I will always have OCD? Uh, it definitely doesn't. The, the latter definitely isn't the case. <laughs> um, the why, why do the themes change? Oftentimes what happens is that it's that there are there are lesser concerns in the person's mind that when the when the, the the current big and ugly OCD obsession kind of gets improved then it's a bit like a you take a main player out of a like a tv series and a, a smaller character has to kind of step in and take up the slack um so it's, it, it can be that a new a new thought was arisen or you become a parent you weren't a parent before you've got a different responsibility in life in some way or, or something so there's a new new change in culture back when I started out um AIDS and HIV was the thing but it's been a while since I've um spoken with anybody with AIDS or HIV OCD but since the advent of the internet now there's many more worries about am I going to accidentally look at inappropriate pornography and you know and end up in trouble for something um that I didn't intend to do 
So life changes, culture changes, news, news stories change as well. So that can be a factor. But as I say, it's oftentimes something lesser that's stepped up. But what people find is that actually with re repeated applications of the principles of learning to become more detached from your thoughts, learning to refocus your attention, learning to stand up to compulsions. And you know, Catherine did just such a brilliant job of how she's this described learning about how her OCD works and what to be suspicious of and what the giveaways are. So it might even just be a feeling that you've got that tells you that your OCD is online as much as anything else. So over um, kind of re repeated experiences of having different kinds of OCD, oftentimes people's uh, understanding of the problem deepens because they learn common principles that cut across different kinds of OCD. Um, and that means that actually with that practice, your chances of keeping it at bay actually go up because you've got wiser and your understanding's deepened and you're more on, on, I mean, it may be impossible to say you'll never get caught out. I'm not sure that I could never get caught out, um, but um, yeah, you become progressively less and li less likely to get caught out by new obsessions because you've learned so much more about how the problem works in, in general. Brilliant, that's really helpful. Catherine, is there anything you wanted to add on to that or should we move on to the next question? No, not at all really, other than the fact that I found it's always been a big life event or it's been once I've got a handle of something, it's then changed to try and catch me out. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. The, the next question, which I think you both might have um, something to kind of, um, thoughts on or, so, or something to, to speak on is um, a lady that said they're currently pregnant and during that period their OCD has escalated and they wondered if there's any evidence around um, OCD being linked to hormones but also just interested in kind of the experience around pregnancy and OCD. Um, either of you but Rob perhaps you want to start and Catherine it might be an area you're interested in speaking to as well. So I'll be honest, I'm a, I don't know very much about the role of um, hormones in OCD, except to say that anything that affects our overall mood is sort of an input into, into OCD. So anything that makes you feel a little more anxious or lower in mood will change the quality of the thoughts that your brain is likely to produce because it's, it's influenced by the sort of soup of, of hormones and emotions and um, neurotransmitters that it, that, it, that it lives in um and so i'm not sure too sure i can speak very uh clearly about um the role of hormones what was the second part of the question it's shot out of my head i was always trying to think about the, i think the nub of the question was do hormones have an impact but i suppose people might also be interested about what she was asking or what she was saying that her OCD has escalated during this period, which I suppose people might be interested about perhaps the, the broader relationship between pregnancy and, and OCD. So I think the, 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 the key thing is to understand the role that responsibility plays in, in OCD. Mm. That we honestly think of that as really being a really sort of pivotal part of, of human psychology where people feel more and more inclined to try and protect um, that which they see as vulnerable. And of course, what's more vulnerable than your unborn baby or even your born baby. Um, so I think that's the key is understanding how that can send those protective instincts that we've all got into, into overdrive. And the, the thing to remember is if you don't drive your brain, it'll drive you. So sometimes it's important to see those, those overprotective instincts ready to kick in and be prepared to try and uh, kind of knock them into shape a little bit if you can. I'm sure Catherine can speak more eloquently on this. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking, I'm very aware that I'm not a clinician with this, um, but I do know that in my experience, you know, obviously as a new mom, you're very much focused on harm coming to your little one. You know, it pays for your brain to spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, the things that might go wrong. And maybe if we just kind of, if we have OCD, we spend more time kind of giving that attention. Um, there are people who speak about this, aren't there? I'm not sure whether I can uh, just share. I mean, there's a charity, isn't there? You know, and there's people who know a lot about um, OCD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are we, are we allowed to kind of... Yeah, do. Yeah, do so Maternal OCD are amazing. I used to do a lot of volunteering and their patron is Fiona Shalikum. 
and she's amazing and I've heard her talk quite a lot about this so it was probably a good idea to check um I know that she's got a new book out called um overcoming uh, I think it's postnatal anxiety and it talks a lot about OCD it's a much needed book and we're all thrilled that she's done it so it might be worth checking out some of her work um I think she'd she'd have a lot to say probably way more reliably than me on it yeah, I, I, we can definitely put a link to maternal OCD um, in the chat and um, uh, and we work really closely with maternal OCD at OCD Action and and take their helpline calls via our helpline. So we'd be really, you're really welcome to contact our helpline if you need any more information on that. Um, brilliant. Thank you both. That's really helpful. Um, and the next question is um, a very, is a question that I think probably came from Rob's talk, which was, does relationship OCD actually exist? Oh, I, I, that's, that's an interesting one. I, I, would, I would say that probably when I first heard people talk about it, I was a little unsure myself as to whether it really was a, was kind of like, was, if it existed, that it was possibly a very rare kind of OCD. Um, but actually, I think what we're learning, um, and we have some, um, there is a, there is an emerging body of evidence and there's some, some clinicians, uh, like uh, Guy Donham, I think we had at our uh, conference, and Danny, um, his colleague whose new name is sadly escaping me, who, who came and spoke with our, our combined conference, Lee, I think, uh, about um, relationship OCD. And I think, um, so the, it's, OCD is really interesting. It always has been the case that if you if we don't know to know about it, then clinicians don't ask about it. And if clinicians don't ask about it, very often patients won't report it because people feel very shamed and embarrassed and you know don't want to be thought as weird or crazy or unusual in some way. So um, as we've learned more about it, what's happened is our awareness has increased. More people are asking about it. People started to do research, and I think. The, the experience and it, it can be a relationship you have with a romantic partner it could be a relationship you have with your your child but that experience of trying there's nothing worse than just trying to check whether you really do love someone or whether you really do have the right kinds of feelings for them or whether they really are the right kind of person it's a bit like dissecting the family cat you by by over analyzing it you kind of often ruin it a bit pardon the analogy I think the analogy is quite helpful. I think that's been a good theme throughout this evening's webinar, actually, some really clear um, and helpful analogies that help us really um, understand some really quite complex ideas. I think it's a good analogy. Um, the, the next question, um, and again, I think this, this maybe came from your talk, Rob, was um, how do I know if um, I spend more than an hour or day an hour a day thinking about my obsessions and if it's not an hour a day does that mean it's OCD? I mean I think we're only we're we're asking people to take relatively rough and ready estimates um and to be truthful very very often it, it's you know if you aggregate the amount of time you spend checking thinking carrying out activities about um you know, certain fears and worries um, it'll e you'll easily find that you've got to know uh, more than that. Some some people find it's helpful to use a, a tally counter to record how frequently they've noticed themselves thinking about it, and that can then give you a clue. Because you might think, oh God, I've I noticed that I've, I've thought about this particular thing 367 times today, so odds are it's been on my mind more than an hour. And it's a it's a it's a rough rule of thumb, really. It's there to set up to stop people saying, oh. I occasionally worry about having um, caused harm in, in this way, or occasionally worry about this um, type of contaminant or something. Um, and we don't want, therefore, people to be given false or positive diagnoses. Um, so I, I wouldn't, if it's, if it's, we put it together with um, also, is this interfering in your life? Is it causing clinically significant distress? Put it, see it as being part of a picture. Um, I wouldn't worry overly much about the hour a day thing, um, particularly if you've got those other elements in place. Yeah, I think that was the part I took really strongly from both your talks was the impact of distress on people's lives being such an important part of what you were both really communicating so clearly. Um, Catherine, a question came in 
specifically for you was um, how and when did you first realise that you had OCD and, and what did that mean for you in your journey? Um, so it's not clear cut. I think I remember watching something when I was about nine. Uh, they had someone on telly who was checking switches a lot. And I thought, well, maybe I have OCD. But then I, because I didn't recognise the other things, it didn't really talk about it. Uh, I thought probably I didn't. I then got a book out of the library. I remember being 15 and on a train to Manchester and reading a book about OCD. And it basically said on the second page, if you've got OCD, uh, you can sort it just by not thinking about it anymore. And I just shut the book and kind of like, <laughs> it must have been a very old book. Um, but yeah, I got it out of the library. And that was another 10 years before I looked into anything again, that it might be OCD because not thinking about it wasn't helping me. Um, and so I kind of had an idea some bits might be OCD, but as OCD likes to do, it made me think that I was far more severe than anyone else. Um, and it wasn't until I had my son and I was so utterly convinced that I was likely to harm him that I went to my doctor not to get help for my mental health, but the demand that I was to be put in prison. You know, I didn't even think I was mentally ill. I thought I was dangerous. And that's when they started the whole process of uh, kind of saying, well, you know, you do have a bit of a history of anxiety, Catherine. I think that's my, that might be what it is. I mean, I'm so glad that was his reaction. But um, he, that's when they started the process of... Um, I didn't have a formal um, diagnosis, but they took me into, um, they kind of sent me through to talk therapy. And that's where I had ERP and CBT. And that's where I learned what was going on and that I wasn't, you know, this monster kind of thing. And that it was OCD. So I've kind of learned in dribs and drabs, but because of the misconception and misunderstanding, it um, made everything a lot longer, really. And it was only after I had my little boy 10 years ago that I really found out that I had OCD and that was wonderful the freedom of finding that out um changed my life completely because I went from feeling like I was someone who needed to be chained up to someone who was ill and needed help um and that was a long process you know growing compassion again for myself having gone through months of thinking that I was a danger was really difficult um but it really did change everything for me and I'm so glad that you know I did go out and get proper help you know, and didn't just rely on hearsay as I had done up until then, really. Oh, you're on mute, Lee. Oh, I was on mute. Um, I, I was just reflecting on the on the length of the journey that you've been through, um, and but but also the power of getting that diagnosis. Mm. Um, Rob, Rob, did you want to add something to what Catherine had said? No, I thought no. I was I was um, I thought it was incredibly helpful. Um, yeah. As a response, um, no, I know, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, no, it was, it was just because I, I thought perhaps you had wanted to. Um, and one of the questions that a lot of people have been interested in, which I suppose follows on from that in some ways, um, is what often we know about um, some of the causes of OCD, and um, there's some particular questions are around the impact of trauma and whether that might cause OCD but broadly what we know about the causes of OCD well the the short answer is not enough um and uh the I think it's safe to say that the the, the, the picture continues to emerge um we obviously know that there are some important um uh, psychological risk factors, um, things like we know that if you're prone to being intolerant of uncertainty and ambiguity, that can be a risk factor. If you're not so good at being able to identify and label your emotions, a bit about alexithymia, that could be <clears throat> a risk factor. Um, we know that um, perhaps being a bit prone and sensitive to dis dis disgust can be a risk factor for some people um and that may well be some of these factors may well be linked to childhood experiences and there is some evidence that if your um attachment to a care figure is insecure when you're young that might predict intolerance or uncertainty and that then might go on to predict um a risk risk of having ocd um and we know that there are other sort of psychological variables such as um, maybe being uh, a bit perfectionistic might be a risk factor. Um, playing perhaps 
paying a lot of importance uh, and attention to one's inner thoughts, that's a risk factor. Um, perhaps being prone to a bit of superstition, that might be, might be a risk factor, but it's what we always say is that, and, and that it may, and of course there may well be some something in your genes that's, um, you know, if you've got a, uh, if you have OCD and you've got an identical twin, there's a sort of 50-50 chance that identical twin might have OCD. Um, so there may be some predispositions in the way we're wired together. But they, by the way, that means, again, you just got to learn to drive that particular kind of car in a particular kind of way. Um, you know, you've got to learn to understand your own brain and work sympathetically with it. Um, and so, you know, anything that's heightened uh, one's awareness of risk, such as uh, traumas may also be a factor, things that have elevated the baseline of anxiety, uh, maybe things that have lowered your mood, all of these things are likely to be contributing factors to OCD. So um, your, your temperament, your life experiences, your genes, um, all of these factors go up. And we always talk about it like it's a kind of cocktail glass, that the, the glass has to be full, but the different layers of the cocktails and the quantities of ingredients are going to be very individual. And one of the things that probably quite a lot of people are aware of, and Catherine um, mentioned it just now, is that we are understanding that if you can learn to be more compassionate towards yourself, and that doesn't mean just being kind, it means really understanding where you're coming from, what causes your suffering, and sometimes really kicking your own bum to really motivate yourself to change that suffering. But sometimes that compassion is is deeper when you understand a bit about kind of where you're coming from, what life experiences have knocked you about and shaped you a bit and how your personality is interacted with your life experiences so that you really get to know what you as a unique human being have been through, how that's affected you. So you can come up, it may not 100% change still the fact you'll need to do some exposure response prevention, for example, but you can come at it with a real sense of understanding and due knowledge um, and sympathy towards yourself as you power through those those challenges. Thank you, Rob. That was really that was super helpful. And I think um, thinking about self compassion and what can really um, be helpful for each individual can make such a difference. And I know Catherine, in when you were speaking, you talked a bit about your toolbox that you have now that helps you kind of really stay well. And I know there were quite a few. Um, questions about kind of some of the things that you have in that toolbox are you able to speak a little bit about about that because I think a lot of people were quite interested in that and um and how that might help them yeah absolutely so I mean it, I think a lot of it was stuff that I learned through therapy as well but I've been able to apply elsewhere you know I kind of I disliked myself so much and thought I was such a massive loser um, because of everything that I'd been through that I actually had to write a diary of little things I'd done in the day and the positive attributes that said about me, you know, so I kind of like had to say I posted a bill that shows that I am responsible, I can handle money, I've left the house even though I might have had uncertainty and things like that. So I've kind of built up these ways of kind of like encouraging myself on. And so if I'm not having a great day, I would maybe try something like that where I can kind of be, I can try and look for the things that I'm doing that are well. Again, I have to be careful this doesn't become a compulsion. Um, I will also, I watch the way I speak to myself. I make sure that I'm, you know, if I'm being particularly negative about myself, I'll try to catch that. Um, that inner voice, I try and make it more compassionate. Um, again, a lot of it is just knowing when to recognize a negative thought. Um, when it's a helpful one and one that is really just me beating myself up for the sake of it it could be something to do with um I, I, I don't know very much about mindfulness um but I do try to make sure that I do things like I will go out and I will have a, do a walk you know I will I will actually try to focus on things outside of my remit because I will spend a long time inside my head or trying to scan things in my body things that actually ground me and put me outside you know whether I'm looking at something or hearing something or smelling something so there's loads and loads of strategies that I can kind of rely on to pull me out of a hole and kind of keep me on a level and I'm sure there's loads more than that but I'm um I'm, I'm drawing a blank with some of them but it is little they're not massive things they're just ways of kind of tweaking the thinking that was incredibly unhelpful you know and just like kind of making sure that I catch myself with stuff and I, and 
that's really helpful and I think in effect that what you're saying is having the things in there that really work for you and help you catch the things that matter to you that's really helpful yeah exactly. um, Even something like music can help you know again as long as you're not using it you know as long as yeah. I'm not using it as a distraction or to avoid something and thinking about something I should be you know like music's massive for me it's really important to me it's my value you know and so even just mm. knowing that if I start feeling really rubbish that music might help me is is a tool you know you wouldn't necessarily think it's a tool but it is well it is it is for me brilliant thank you um we're I, we're nearly coming to the end we have two um two more questions so um the one of the big questions that's come up is um can OCD be inherited? So I think that's a big question that people often want to know, often particularly when they're at the start of their journey. So I don't know, um, maybe Rob, you want to start, and if Catherine, you have anything you want to add on that, please do. As ever, it's a it's a complex um, situation. It, it, what I what I have seen is that maybe people do spot that. Um, in their family history, there seems to have been a bit of a tendency running through the generations. Um, and that's, you know, that's not, not that surprising. Um, we are a, an anxious species um, and very prone to worrying excessively and um, becoming quite concerned and, and you know, deeply involved in various things that are, feel threatening to us. But I, what's also so you might some people do do notice that there may be some kind of family um, history. What's amazing about that is though that very often what that means is that if if the person who's got OCD is, is start to understand their own OCD, they then they will then carry that forwards and um, be very good at spotting maybe their child becoming a little too anxious about certain kinds of contaminants or certain kinds of ideas and. One of the biggest mistakes that parents can sometimes make is that we worry that we're going to make things worse if we kind of if we stop our child from checking or um i can remember once when many many years ago when my house was burgled my younger daughter was asking his most nights oh my goodness are we going to be burgled again and um thankfully i had the presence of mind to say well maybe um Partly because I wanted her to learn to become tolerant of, of uncertainty, and, and it turned out to be a good thing because exactly a year later we were burgled again. So, um, thank, thankfully, I didn't rely on reassurance. Um, but the, the thing that what's amazing is that even if you have a, you know, maybe you've got a bit of a family predisposition, if you know what to look out for in yourself, and oftentimes tell you a lot to look out for in your child, and rather than accommodate or adjust, you might want to just encourage games that involve. A bit of dirt and playing muddy puddles, um, games that involve a bit of anti-superstition, or whatever you think is a thing that might be important, and be ready to lean into and grasp those nettles and and do it maybe in a not too heavy and not too serious way, but to to get on top of it. Um, so, uh, uh, potentials and predispositions might be inherited, but outcomes aren't. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the example about your family. Again, an excellent example that we can hold in our mind that um, is really is a really solid way of thinking about something I think can be really difficult to discuss. Um, and the the final, well, there's actually two, two, this is a two part question. I'm going to sneak two parts into this final question. Um, lots of people have been asking um, about whether there's any self-help books that anybody would recommend. Rob, I feel you might have the odd one that you're <laughs> keen to recommend here. Um, and then Catherine, you might have one. Rob, do you want to go first? Well, D David Veal and I spent, did spend a long, and I mean long time revising um, our book, Overcoming uh, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Um, and it, these, these books are, genuine labours of love. I could go and work at McDonald's to get paid way more by the hour that, that um, and we get, I think we get like literally pennies per copy. So there is no, there is no skin in that game for us other than really wanting to try and share the benefit of the experience that our patients have given us um, through working with us and trying to share that with, with, with others. So, you know, I, I, I stand by that. Yeah, and and um, and as a charity, we, we, um 
have it as one of the top books on our um, recommended reading list. It's a it's a really strong um, book. So uh, we would definitely be happy to pop that in the chat. And um, Catherine, is there anything you would um, like to ask? Uh, uh, sorry, I'd like to add to that as a recommendation. I'm not ready to ask a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I second that. I, I've got Rob's book and it's incredible. Um, there's also, there's a guy called um, John Hirschfield who does a lot of mindfulness and OCD. He's got like a little workbook um, that I found incredibly helpful. And that seems to be um, quite popular in the States. And I found that to teach me about um, that. And I thought I thought it was really good. It kind of teaches you that thing about getting out of your head um and i it actually gives you like little exercises so i'd go with that one as well anything by john hershey really is very helpful and i know lots of people are keen to know where they can access waving so um i'm is it is it on general release yet catherine is no it? it's not so we um they won't let us in any more film festivals if it comes out on um general release sadly so we're kind of with this double-edged sword at the moment where we really want it to come out but we're also thrilled that it's getting into more and more film festivals all the time so we're hoping it'll probably be around Christmas maybe watch it after Christmas it's not the happiest of films <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's very raw isn't it so it's so very maybe, raw it ends yeah. well but um yeah no it's not the easiest to watch it's it. very raw. <laughs> wonderful well I wanted to say a huge thank you to Catherine and Rob for giving up their evening and um sharing their wisdom and their thoughts and their their hope with us and a huge thank you to our, all 160 of you for giving up your time and um, and trusting in the three of us for an OCD action for sharing um, for sharing these thoughts with us and for trusting in us. We're hugely grateful to you. Um, do keep an eye out for when this recording comes out and for the newsletter with the next uh, sessions on. They will all um, follow a similar format to this, although the bar has been set high for, for the next webinar. Um, and if you would like to hear more about the work of OCD Action or get involved with OCD Action and supporting us in any way, there's links in the chat about how to donate, volunteer, get involved, and we'd very much love you to do that. You can only We can only do what we do because of the support of people like you. So thank you so much we will wrap up shortly and I hope you all have a peaceful um, and pleasant evening. Take care and I hope to see you all again soon.